this is, this is, this is. Welcome to the podcast, brand new episode 40, 472, moving right along. Stay Up All Night is still available, it's still out, add it to your music libraries, go watch the video if you haven't already watched the video. What is wrong with you? If you listen to this podcast and you haven't watched our video, I don't know, I don't get it, but I'm sure that everybody listening to this podcast right now has indeed checked out the new MXPX song, Stay Up All Night. We have a new album coming August 25th, it's called Find A Way Home. Pre-order vinyl, CDs, T-shirts, hoodies. We got a bunch of stuff. But we have CDs, and we've sold a ton of these CDs. So uh, that tells me tells me we need to order more soon. But look what we got. Look at this. Oh, my God. It's the picture disc. For those that aren't watching the video, sorry, I have the blur on. It's really annoying. Um, Anyway, all these, all these records, all available at mxpeaks.com. Love you guys. Love you for your orders. Um, I know a a ton of people have ordered and we are dealing with those pre-orders right now. If you're ordering something that's not a pre-order kind of thing, um, you probably will get your order very soon if you haven't already done that. So mxpeaks.com for that. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks to all of our Music Monday submissions last week. Um, we don't have any more right now, so I'm just just wait for it to pile up again. Uh, but you can submit your song, YouTube link, please, but submit the link to uh, the Mike Herrera Podcast Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group, but you're free to join. Just come on over. Um, Bob McKnight, my producer, is... Uh, He's kind of the front man over there. He's, he's, he's the bouncer and the manager over there. Anyway, good times. We always, we always have a good time over there. All right, let's get to it. I told you about MXPX.com. I told you about Stay Up All Night, our new song. It's a song about struggling with, with failure. You know, you, you feel when you feel like you're just failing over and over and, you know, you're letting down someone you love a lot. You know, like it, it could be a thousand different situations, but I know we've all been there because we've all failed. You know, every, every single person has failed. And, uh, that feeling when you feel like you can't get anything right, it's the worst. And that's, that's what I was feeling when I wrote this song. And, um, I really hope you guys can, can get something from it, you know, apply it to your own life somewhere. And, and hopefully it gives you a little bit of, uh, positive reinforcement to keep going, never give up. Just stay up all night. All right, let's get to some voicemails. We're going to do voicemails this week, just purely voicemails. There's a bunch of voicemails in the queue that I haven't gotten to yet. So now we're just getting to July, now that we're in August. So a lot of your your voicemails are going to be from last month, not this month. By the way, it's August. Beautiful. Uh, I can't believe it's summer's like becoming, becoming like, something of the past and I know we're still in it the, the new MXPX album hasn't even come out yet it's coming out August 25th so it, we're still going through summer but man I just when we get to August you know the writing's on the wall am I right I think I'm right all right let's get to some of your voicemails here hey Mike Shannon from Toronto uh just two quick questions well really one question but two particular bands I wanted to ask you about. Um, I know you're uh, also playing in, in Tumble Down, uh, kind of a side project band. Uh, I want to go back to um, two other bands that you had, which you don't really talk about. Uh, one, I have actually heard you mention a few times in your, uh, your, your live uh, social media recordings for MXPX is Arthur which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is your middle name. Uh, Arthur, I love. I have the album uh, on CD. Um, But the one I'm more interested in hearing about is uh, The Cooties. What was that about, and what happened to The Cooties? And how did it start? What happened? Where did it go? Um, I think it's a band that a lot of MXPX MXPX fans don't really know about. 
Uh, I think there was a few MXPX tracks on that album, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, yeah, I would love to hear more about the Cooties. Thank you so much. Love you guys. All right, Shaner. Thanks for calling in again. Um, yeah, Arthur, you you nailed it. That's my middle name. That was a band that I started just because I wanted to do some slower 50s type emo songs. And it wasn't emo back then, but that's kind of what it was. It was like this post-punk kind of thing. And that's why I started Arthur. And, um, you know, that kind of became not really needed, you know, after a while. It was like some slow songs for, for MX could be just MXP songs and then all the other ones are just my Herrera solo songs but um the Cooties on the other hand yeah that that was a fun band we started that in high school it was it MXPX was already a band we were doing well but um it was um Tom Tom on guitar no Tom on drums because Tom used to play Tom Wisniewski used to play drums back before he played guitar so he was on drums um this friend of ours, Giles, was on bass, and then it was me. And it started out as a three-piece, just like that. Um, and then very quickly, I was on guitar. And then very quickly, um, we added Eric Buckham, a friend of ours. Eric's the guy I called um, when I was looking for a drummer for MXPX. I was looking for to start a band, and I knew Eric played drums. And Eric told me on the phone, he's like, yeah, actually, I, I switched to guitar. <laughs> so I don't play drums anymore. But I know a guy that plays drums. And that guy turned out to be Yuri Ruli. The rest is history. So we kind of, a lot of, I guess you could say MXPX owes Eric Buckham a debt of gratitude for telling me about Yuri, for introducing me to Yuri. So anyway, back to Eric Buckham. So he joined the band. It was a four-piece, just... It all started one night. We were just jamming out, ha having fun at uh, Giles's house, and we decided let's start a band. And we put a bunch of ideas into a hat, and it was like the beach, and it was like the weatherman, and then it was like you know like a red hat or you know whatever Coke. And so, <laughs> so there was like all these ideas, dumb ideas in a hat, and we'd pull one out and go, the beach, okay. Um, Let's write a song about the beach. Now the beach sucks. You know, um, that's how it started. That's pretty much how it, how it continued. Uh, we played locally around. We did one tour with MXPX where we toured nationally uh, in the U.S. And um, we put out a record on Tooth & Nail Records and we recorded with Steve Kravak. And Steve kicked our butts. And after that, I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure that's when we decided to re-record Life in General with Steve Kerback. So, I mean, it, there was a lot going on in these years. A lot. This was, this was the early years of just things were just getting going really fast. So the Cooties was a really fun band that I, I loved to, to be part of. I loved playing guitar. I loved how sloppy it was, how, how cool and different it was from MXPX. Um, but, you know, you're right. I, I wrote... I wrote that song, I'm Okay, You're Okay, and we put it on the Cooties album, but, you know, nobody really heard the Cooties album, so we decided, that's a really good song, let's put, let's make that, you know, an MXPX song, and so I, so we did. And, you know, like, old school people were like, oh, that's not an MXPX song, that's a Cooties song. It's like, yeah, but it's not, it's, it's my song. I wrote it, so no one helped me. I wrote it all by myself. So it's a Mike Herrera song, and then, and then it, it was also a Cooties and an MXPX song. So so that's what I say about that. <laughs> but I love doing the Cooties. So much fun. Uh, we spell our band name C-O-O-T-E-E-S. So it doesn't. it's not spelled like the actual Cooties game. It was a board game called the Cooties. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't anything we really pushed too hard. We just really, really had fun with it. When we played shows, it was for fun. We never made money. We never did any of that. I, I think Giles got all the the royalties, if there was any. He took all those, um, not because we let him. He just took them. So and there's a lot going on there. But um, yeah, you know, I'm sure everything's cool now. Uh, 
I'm sure he probably regrets that. I don't know. Um, I certainly am not really worried about it, to be honest. Um, but I do, I do still hold true to my my good vibes and good memories from from that era. And the cooties really was fun. I had a good time. All right, let's go to the next next one. Here we go. Hey, Mike, I'll try to make three minutes. Uh, you'd mentioned that you'd like to feel calls about things that aren't about bands or songs or gear. So this is that call. In 1994, I was 17. My little brother was 14. We were pretty inseparable. It was never, uh, what's up with Adam? Or just uh, what are Adam and Joe doing? You know, it was like, we were always like uh, part of the same thing. I was given poking at you by my youth pastor for my birthday because uh, I guess I'd gotten in punk rock and my mom was concerned. Um, I think they thought I was going to hell. But uh, anyway, my brother, he was kind of, you know, somebody that I always listened to music with. And um, we both loved him XDX. We drove all over Texas in my old truck to see y'all. San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, Corpus Christi, didn't matter. Uh, we would make the trip. Uh, one of my clearest memories of him was driving to Blockbuster Music to buy Slowly Going to Brave the Buffalo the day it came out and uh, listening to it and just driving around that way and just been over and over again for like that entire day. It was awesome. This July 10th, it's uh, 10 years since we lost Joe. Uh, Joe lost his sight with mental illness and uh, it ended his life. Um, he had, from a young age, been dealing with struggles that, at the time, I think people attributed to, you know, adolescence or, you know, simple depression or even worse, the church would say, he, you know, he's dealing with demons. I, I bring the church up because while, you know, it's been flawed in my experience, without the church, my mother and father, they couldn't have carried on. I got through uh, myself by drinking a hell of a lot. Um, I remember my brother I would like to say a few things and follow with a question. First, um, I would like to let people know who are suffering from that. The pain that you're feeling is real. It may not be just some adolescent phase. You should ask for advice from people who are not close to you. Ask for advice from people who actually know about mental health and the struggles that people have with mental health. And second, if you're seeing someone in your life struggling, I suggest take it seriously, take it outside of something you excuse away. Find advice from people who aren't close to you. I'm going to pick up where I think I left off. If you're seeing someone in your life struggling, take it seriously. It may be that they need you to help find the help that they need. Sometimes they just don't see it. Thirdly, I'd like to say if you've lost them to suicide as a result of mental illness, you're not alone. You probably feel guilt and anger, and that's okay. Forgive yourself and forgive anyone who's succumbed to mental illness. I have a quick aside before I ask you, Mike. Um, I do want to thank uh, Clank who is a, an amazing industrial artist. Uh, shortly after my brother died, he had reached out, we had connected, and he did include my brother in a video um, for a song called The Beast Within, which is about the struggle of losing people to mental illness. And I encourage anyone to watch it. And uh, I'm glad that my brother is part of something like that. Mike, do you, anybody close to you, have any experience with this kind of loss? And if you do, what's your takeaway from it? How do you help um, 
other people understand it and how does it inform your art moving forward? I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my voicemails and normally when I call I'm talking to you off the cuff but I had to write all this down because sometimes it's hard to talk about and put all of my thoughts in order. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. And I appreciate everything that you do for us. You have a great day. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for writing it down. I think that actually does help a lot. And uh, we appreciate that. So your brother, Joe, um, man, sorry to hear that. That's, that's real. Um, I have lost some people I know to, I guess it was mental health issues. It was suicide. Um, nobody that was like my brother or sister or, or you know, best friend. Um, it was all just friends that I, you know, knew, but not super well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't, I can't relate to that the way you can with your brother. That's, that's rough. That's rough. That's heavy. And, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, and anybody else? Yeah. Like, 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 uh, Adam said, I think your name's Adam, uh, take it seriously. And it's hard, you know, when you grow up, you grow up and you, you you're, you're in the same body and brain that you've always been in. Yet you do maybe feel a little different. And it's, it's hard to realize that Oh, this is happening. This is real. This this can actually be a serious thing that I need to pay attention to, because you know when you're a kid, you grow up, you fall down, you get your knee scraped up, you get back up, you cry a little maybe, but you're gonna be fine. You, you know, you move on, and and it's just not the case. You know, as things move on in in life, things get more and more serious. It feels like it's 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 tough. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I just, actually, I just went to a memorial service for a friend of mine that passed away uh, about a month ago, and we hung out around mid, my my early 20s, I would say my early 20s, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, somewhere in there, we hung out a lot, and you know, as the years went on, I hadn't seen this guy in, I don't know, 20, 15 years or something, you know, like maybe it wasn't that long. Maybe, maybe it was, it was right before I had kids that I probably saw him last. So it was probably, you know, 11, 12 years ago. But, um, it's just wild to think about, you know, people are out there, just people we know just out there living their lives. And, um, and it's really easy just to go about your day and to do what you do. That's what I do, and I go about my day all the time, right? Um, and not reach out to people that you know could really use it. So, I mean, I got a text message from a friend of mine the other day. It was like yesterday, in fact. It was just a little rant. It was like very much, it was like, hey, I appreciate you keep going, keep doing what you're doing. I know you're doing great. You know, like that kind of thing. And it was just like, it always takes me a little back when I, cause I do that to people too. Like not necessarily every day, but if I have the wild hair and I think about it, Oh, I'm going to text the, my, my friend or this person or this, whatever, and just check in and just say hi and whatever it is. But, um, to have somebody do that to me, it was like, oh, okay, that's, that's cool. It feels good. It feels good. Yeah. I, I, I just love it. So anyway, um, Man, I appreciate the call. I appreciate, you know, you listening to this music all these years and having this in common with your brother and um, the fact that Clank did a song, you know, with your brother being part of it. That's that's really cool. Clank, I know Clank. I haven't seen him in 15, 20 years, you know, but I know Clank. I've known him for a long time and, and always been a, a, a beautiful person. You know, he's a really nice nice and and respectable kind of guy really cool and he's got the long me he was like the metal guy you know super super rocker dude but um he's so sweet anyway thank you thank you for that call all right i don't know I, as you can tell i'm like stammering i don't really know what to say but um 
but it's very real. And uh, and I hope that that everyone, you know, can find a place, find a place to uh, feel comfortable to share your thoughts. And and if that's this podcast, so be it. You can call in anytime, um, and uh, we'll hear about it. All right, let's get to the next the next uh, voicemail. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Brandon. Just calling. I was listening to On the Cover here today. It's been a while since I've listened to it, but it was an album that I really loved as a kid. And a while back, you went through all the albums, your favorite albums, where you recorded them, um, things you remember about that, about them, and wondered if you could reminisce a bit about On the Cover and Heard somewhere that you played a lot of the guitars on that. Didn't know if that was true. Um, don't know where you recorded it or anything like that. But I just remember I didn't know those songs because sound so cool. So thanks for what you do. Brandon, what's up? Yeah, man, uh, on the cover. That was 1995, I think, right after we – right before we gra- – why not – I guess was it 95 or 96? Guess now I'm not really sure, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I thought we recorded it during the summertime at a vast studios in Seattle, which is uh, the U District of Seattle. Um, yeah, it was Bob Moon producing, and he recorded us. Uh, I'm just trying to think the songs. Okay, there was Marie Marie by the Blasters. We did that song, and that was what you're probably thinking about with guitar, you know, because I played the guitar on that song. It's got a fifties doo up kind of Chuck Berry vibe. Like, like, like it's got like bendy notes and, and kind of a rockabilly vibe to it. So I wasn't necessarily a great guitar player or anything, but like as the songwriter, I was playing a lot more guitar than anybody. I was just constantly noodling. And so I, I, I took over and I, I played those parts, but uh, Tom still played most of the parts on the whole the whole EP. Um, Brian Adams, we rec- we covered uh, "Summer of '69" by Brian Adams. Those recordings were pretty rough. Like we 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 really probably didn't have any business doing those songs because we didn't really know how to play our instruments. I'll tell you that. Um, we had a friend of ours, Leanne. She came out. She was from our. She went to our high school with us, Leanne, uh, and she played like a big sax, like the sax was bigger than her almost. And so she came and played um, on Buddy Holly, Oh Boy, uh, did a great job on that. Um, that was a really fun, like I would say Oh Boy was was the highlight for me, getting to record that song, getting to play that song. It was just such a cool little rendition that we did of Oh Boy by Buddy Holly. Yeah, that's about it. You know, it was, it was, a, it was about a week or, or about a week of recording or so pretty sure uh uh matt johnson came by he was the drummer of blenderhead uh drummer of don't know uh played drums for 90 pound wuss now and again um but yeah he was always hanging out and and actually i just got to see matt johnson last weekend at the um not this last weekend but the weekend before so july 30th he was in Bremerton. We went to see 90 Pound Wuss in Bremerton, and it was awesome. It was so much fun seeing everybody. One, the band was great. They put on a great show. They really prepared. They really did put in a lot of work for this set, and they did great. I loved it. So aside from just that, uh, the Fibs played maybe their last show. The Fibs are a local Bremerton band. Uh, we love them. Uh, you know, it's kind of sad. Uh, funny thing about the Fibs, the drummer is Dale, is Dale Yob. Dale Yob from the Cooties. <laughs> so it's a small world when you're talking about Bremerton, Washington. But Dale Yob was uh, in the Cooties. And then he, yeah, he, he took over Eric Buckham's spot uh, in the Cooties. So he's on the full-length album that we have out, Let's Play House and all that. And he, he contributed a couple songs. He wrote a couple songs for that. And uh, Dale's a great guitar player. Um, so when he moved over to the drums, all of a sudden he's in this band called the Fibs. I was like, wait, what? It was cool to see him, though. Um, but, yeah, they played. It was great. But seeing all the, the people from Seattle, the, Ed Kerrigan from Don't Know was there, uh, a bunch of just just a bunch of people. It was great. So 
anybody that showed up and supported 90 pound wuss for their first show in 23 years thank you guys for supporting that very cool to see and i know that i know personally jeff suffering was really really happy with the turnout there's a ton of people there it was great and um man you can't really ask for anything better than that just a, a good turnout good vibes seeing a bunch of old friends you haven't seen in years pretty amazing all right let's do let's do let's do more Hey, Mike. Uh, this is Adam, Canadian friend calling from the outskirts of Vancouver, B.C. I um, had a little thought about, uh, I saw on your website you uh, did an interview with your mom. thought it was pretty pretty neat. Love to see the rest of that. Um, one quick idea I thought for maybe the podcast, and I don't know if you've done it already, but um, maybe uh, getting Holly and uh, Yuri's wife and Tom's wife to sit down uh kind of do a little get a perspective from the wives point of view of you know what it's like you guys being on tour and maybe how you guys all met and just I don't know you kind of need to get their perspective but my question for today is um and maybe again you've talked about it on an ep- another episode if you have uh maybe you could let me know what episode that is and I'd love to to listen to it but um and not that I want to you know degrade tooth and nail or anything but what uh, I was wondering if you could go into detail about kind of what really happened there. I, I kind of, I mean, I guess I know the gist of it, but like what all really happened? I know, uh, you know, there's been some, there was some, I don't know, maybe you want to call it bad blood, but uh, yeah, I mean, and not that we're going to, like you say, uh, make fun of them or, or anything like that, but uh, I'd just like to know kind of maybe in your own words and kind of in one big uh, sort of uh, detail, like what, what really happened and what went on there? Um, yeah. And like I said, if you've already talked about it or maybe you're like, I don't want to talk about that. That's water under the bridge then that's fine. But um, yeah, I'd just love to get your view on that. Thanks. All right. All right, Adam. Thanks, man. Vancouver, BC, not too far. Um, yeah. I've talked about this a little bit, but, but, I might as well try to give you a little recap. Um, everybody wants a little recap now. And, and as time goes on, it kind of changes a little bit, like sort of like the things that stick out to me change a little bit. And some of the things stay the same, some of the things that stick out. But let me just say um, it was it was early on. It was like 1996 or 7 or somewhere in there, 96 maybe. Um, we're doing great. Um, we're touring all over the place, and we're doing the demos for Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo. And we go to Olympia, Washington, and we record um, at, uh, oh, see, I, if I had known this, I would have done the research and looked up the guy's name, but I can't remember the guy's name right now. Um, for a proper story, I would. I would tell you his name. But we were recording with this guy, this old guy, really great. And he recorded all the Olympia bands, all the punk bands in Olympia. And um, when we went in to like meet with him, uh, it wasn't Death Cab for Cutie. It was um, it was ah, uh, uh, it was um, what was that band? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> they have that like weird, weird song about the river and the. Anyway, you guys are gonna be like, what is that? It's something about like um, like. Uh, what is this band like it's gonna drive me crazy and right when i'm done recording i'm gonna think of them but um they got really big for a really for a while and they were on they were on like kill rock stars or so, something like that like an like a really like punk indie rock post-punk kind of label in olympia washington so anyway um <laughs> Let me start my story over again, and let's forget about the <laughs> Modest Mouse. Oh, I figured it out. Modest Mouse. Ah, okay, sorry. Brain fart right there. Couldn't think of him. So Modest Mouse was in there recording. Like, the vocalist was in there, like, doing vocals, and we, like, show up to the studio. And the, met, met Modest Mouse guys. Hey, how you doing? Um, and talked to this guy, and then we ended up, you know, the next week we came in and recorded and, and recorded a bunch of songs with him, just demos, not for the actual album. Um, and while we were there, we were talking about our contract and he was like, 
you know, I've looked at some other, you know, tooth and nail records contracts and they look really bad. And so that was just sort of like our, what, really? Like, maybe we should take a look at this. And then we went, we took it to our manager, Creighton Burke at the time. And from there, it just, Creighton Burke kind of just took, took over and was like, all right, we're going to, we're going to get a better, you know, we, so we, we're going to get a better deal. And so we asked tooth and nail to fix this, 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 this in our deal. And we'll, we're good. We're, we'll stay. Well, Brandon Ebel said, all right, let me, let me go talk to the lawyer. And he goes and talks to his lawyer and he comes back, we get on the phone or whatever it is. And he's like, well, my lawyer said, if I do all the things you guys want, want me to do, uh, I'm going to lose too much money. So, so, um, so basically he's like, no, we're not doing anything. And at that point we were young punk kids that were very much against authority and we didn't like the sound of that. And so at that point we became very mad at tooth and nail and started hating them. And, you know, we wanted to do everything we could to just get off the label and move on and, and see you later because we don't want to be, we don't want to be on a label with somebody that's going to just be so disingenuous, you know, but, um, so that, so I don't want to bore you with all the details of lawyers and trials and things like that. And they put out, let it happen. We sued them for that because they put out, let it happen, which was 32 tracks or whatever of B sides songs that aren't done songs that are very sloppy demos. They put that out right at the same time. We put out our album slowly going the way of the Buffalo that see slowly still went gold, but I almost feel like it could have went platinum if it didn't have let it happen to compete with. Because Let It Happen was 32 tracks for like five ninety nine or something like that. And Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo was, I don't know how many tracks, 14 tracks for, uh, right, you know, it's $12, $12 or something, like eleven ninety nine, something like that, right? So there was just all this going on. Um, and we got off the label. We went, we went to A&M, signed to A&M Records, and we were with them for three albums. And ultimately, they weren't they weren't really doing great for us either. And so we we left there and we went to Side One Dummy, which really actually made a big difference. And I feel like we got a lot more, I don't know, attention from the label. Whatever it is, you need you need somebody to like care. Um, so that was great. And then from there, we actually <laughs> Tommy Rat, who was our man. You know, we fired Creighton Burke years later. Uh, but we had a new manager, which was Tommy Rat at the time. He was like our interim manager. It wasn't really ever meant to be like a permanent fixture, which he never was. He, but he managed us for like one or two years. Anyway, he did the deal with Tooth and Nail. He started talking to them, and he's like, Mike, let me tell you, I'm talking to Brandon Ebel, and I think we're going to get our publishing back, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, uh, I don't know. And ultimately, I was like, all right, you know what? Let's bury the hatchet, water under the bridge, whatever. Let's let's see if we can work with these guys. So, we signed uh, a one album deal with Tooth and Nail to do Secret Weapon, and that um, that gave us a bunch of things back that we had originally asked for in that first the first time when we were you know asking them, "Can you fix this? Can you fix this?" And he's like, "Ah, my lawyer says I'll lose too much money." Well, they 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 didn't necessarily fix those things, but they did some other things like getting, I got my publishing back on all the albums, that kind of thing, um, which is huge. So, I mean, something that should have been mine in the first place always, but Hey, better late than never. Right. So, um, so I consider us to be good on good terms with tooth and nail records right now. Like there's always that little like wariness, but at the same time, Brandon Ebel is somebody that I would not, you know, I don't feel like punching him or anything. Like I've seen him plenty of times over the years. He'll come to my, he'll come to MXPX shows. He'll come to, you know, I was in Amber, uh, playing with Amber Lynn in New York and he was out there and I talked to him then. So like I've talked to Brandon Ebel a bunch of times since all of this and since even Secret Weapon uh, and since we left them the second time. But, um, but it's not like, you know, we're not, 
you know, super close or anything like that. And it, and it definitely was weird with a lot of their employees back in the day. I'm sure that a bunch of their employees hated us just because of the fact that, oh, this band's attacking my, my place of business, my team, my team, you know, and, and I can understand that. So it's okay to be hated. You know, if you're an artist, you have to be okay with being hated. It's just how it is. Like, it's almost better when people talk crap about my music, my band, whatever, because I feel like, okay, I'm doing something right. Good, good. Because if people don't talk at all about you, ah, that's not good. All right. I hope that uh, clears up a little bit. Maybe you have more questions about it. Feel free to ask. There's there's more to it, of course. There's little side stories and fun little bits here and there. But um, But that's the gist. That's the gist. All right. Let's get to another voicemail. Hey, Mike. Ben David from Florida. Quick question for you. I was watching uh, the Everything Sucks When You're Gone video, and at the end, when she comes back, she has a grocery bag, and you say, did you get the? And she says, of course they did. Uh, of course I did. <laughs> what did she get? I've always been curious. What do you, what anyway, did you... love you guys. Uh, looking forward to response. Take care. Sorry about that, David. Or Ben. Hey, Ben. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. That's, that's so funny. I'm remembering that video. Um, that video was just crazy. Like the director was great, but he's just like, all right, let's try this. Let's do this. And, and, and of course we're game. Like MXPX has always been about, let's just try it. Okay, cool. Maybe you shouldn't always do that, but it, they had me doing some weird stuff like, um, obsessing over a sculpture and like kissing a skin, you know, like weird stuff. Uh, my favorite part of that bit video was when I got to, pull the sheet off of the dinner table and all the all the dishes and glasses smashed on the floor. It was great. Love that. Now, what do I say at the end? Uh, oh, did you get the... I'm not going to tell you what it was because that's literally the whole point of the end of the video is you're never supposed to know what it is that she's getting. But I will tell you this. The whole idea from the video is you think this guy's obsessing over this girl because she's gone when she's just at the grocery store. And that is how obsessed this guy is, is he can't even hang while she goes to the grocery store. That's the whole gist. Yeah, kind of dumb. But <laughs> but it's uh, the song itself is just a straight up love song. Everything sucks when you're gone, you know. But um, yeah. There was a bunch of different things, by the way, of what it was. Did you get the um, probably Cadbury eggs? Did you get the Cadbury eggs, or did you get the did you get the milk? Yeah, there there wasn't really ever a thing. That was that was the cliffhanger. All right, thanks, Ben. Let's do one more. You guys have been great. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Thanks for calling in. If you want to call in, you can call, uh, leave a voicemail. The number is 1-360-830-6660. It's in the show notes everywhere. You can find it. Um, let's get this last one. Hey, what's up, dude? Been listening to you guys since 1994. I'm skateboarding to work, listening to your podcast on the way, and I just want to say I love you, Mike. I've seen MXTX more than I've seen any other band in my life, and I will always love y'all. Y'all are the best. So sick. Later. Sick, dude. The fact that you're skateboarding to work, and then you're listening to the podcast, and then you're calling the podcast, and then you're going to be skateboarding to work, hopefully on Monday, when you listen to this, and it's going to be just like this whole, like, whoa, Inception kind of vibe. Like, is this reality or was that reality? I don't know. But thank you. Thank you for the love. I appreciate it. Um, I can't wait for everybody to hear the new album, Find a Way Home. There's uh, going to be 13 songs. And I I, I kind of feel like you're going to love, love every single song. Because every single song sounds like MXPX. It's like, okay, that's that MXPX song. Oh, that's that type of MXPX song or whatever. You know, you know, of course, they sound like themselves, each song. But you get, you get my drift, right? You get my drift? I think so. All right. Let's, uh, let's end it here. Thank you guys 
and girls so much. And you know what we're missing on the podcast? We're missing some ladies' voices because it's all been dudes lately, which I love you dudes. We need some ladies to call in. Please, ladies, call in. Ask me a question about the new song, the new album, the new video, whatever. Uh, we have pre-orders up at mxpeaks.com. So if you have a question about any of the variants for vinyl, if you have a question about hoodies or T-shirts or any of the designs, please let me know. I would love to talk about it on the podcast. All right. Shout out to Bob McKnight for producing and, and doing what he does. Appreciate you. And um, <laughs> shout out to Skivvy. Remember last week? Um, that's it. That's it, I think. Um, we're just going through it, trying to trying to keep my head up. And I hope you guys are too. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.